seven, but it might be three. All right. So the next one is, is how can we explain the Cambrian explosion? How do we explain the Cambrian explosion? We've talked a little bit about the geological record so far. And the Cambrian is the oldest period in the Paleozoic era. And, and basically, uh, what we're talking about here is just a massive amount of diversity showing up at the same time. And we say probably all animal phyla appear in the Cambrian. Um, and you're like, how do we not know? How do we not know? It? It's, it seems it should be a yes or a no, right? Do all animal phyla show up? Yes or no. Uh, but believe it or not, some fossils are pretty difficult to figure out what they are, especially fossils that are buried under that much rock, because I don't know if you knew this or not, but rock is heavy. And when you have a lot of rock sitting on top of you, coupled with like tectonic activity with, with rock shifting, uh, a lot of those fossils get deteriorate. Uh, get destroyed or deteriorate through time. So some of these are really hard to figure out exactly what they are, but probably all animal phyla, anywhere from 34 to 38 phyla, depending on whose classification scheme you use, uh, appear during the Cambrian explosion. So a couple ways to interpret this. One is we could interpret it this as this is the beginning of the global flood that scripture talks about. And if you were going to have a global flood, I don't know if you knew this or not, but water destroys a lot of things. It'd be, it's, just, it's just a powerful force. And if you're going to have a global flood, this global flood is going to move an enormous amount of sediment around. And if you've got water carrying a bunch of sediment around, you have great potential to bury a lot of material. And so what you would predict is at the beginning of this, um, of the rock formed by this sediment being moved by this water, you're going to get a pretty good sampling of everything alive on earth at that time. That's kind of what you find. You, you get all animal phyla represented right at the beginning here of the, basically right at the beginning of the fossil record. So that's one way to explain it. This is the beginning of the global flood that scripture talks about. Another way, this is under, you know, methodological naturalism. We have to be able to explain some way in which we can generate rapid diversification. Because a traditional idea of how evolution works, where it's slow accumulation of differences over time, it doesn't explain the Cambrian explosion very well. We need, we need rapid diversification. So maybe uh, what you're looking at is, is an environment um, where you have, you know, something that's more suitable for animal life so that we, we can have the potential for animals to actually live and the populations to grow. But then we also have to figure out some way in which we can generate massive change really quickly. Well, the only way to really do it is to be able to take your populations and break them into pieces, isolate them into different groups. So the idea here is maybe there were a number of different shallow lagoons uh, along like a continental shelf. And so these, these, these pools were in some way isolated from one another. And so the, the population inside of one pool is not interacting with a population in another pool and neither of those are interacting with a population in a third pool and neither none of those three you know so on and so forth and so you get isolation that then becomes structural or feeds these structural modifications okay so we have an environment that's more favorable to animals so you can get massive growth in your number of animals and then we have some mechanism by which we could isolate them so that then they could diversify. Yeah. I was a little bit confused when you were talking about the flood. So you think it started before the flood? And then what happened? No, the Cambrian explosion marks the beginning of flood deposits. Now, the actual flood would have started before that, but, and then at some point it starts depositing sediment that the water is picking up as it just destroys rocks somewhere else. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so these isolated pools, 
uh, provide an area for geographic isolation. They also provide a place where, you know, there's enough space for us to really get some really cool stuff happening that can fuel this. Because it, it's more than just saying like, hey, these populations are now isolated from one another, right? That's one thing, but then you need them, you need those two populations to experience different environments. Otherwise, they may be isolated, but there's no drive to change them. So they need to be isolated and the environments need to be slightly different. But if we have these pools are large enough to facilitate some complex interactions like predator prey, you know, maybe you have one species in one of those pools that likes to eat the other things that are there and you have a different predator in a different pool. So the environment's a little bit different. And so there is a drive to, um, there's, a, there's already, the, the isolation is facilitated and now there is a drive for those different populations to change to meet their different environmental uh, requirements. Okay, make sense? And then at the same time, the idea here is that uh, Hox genes start to show up for the first time, these master control genes that provide the molecular switch necessary to facilitate the changes that are meeting the different environmental needs, right? So we've got the isolation, check. We have different environmental needs, check. And now we have a molecular tool to facilitate the change in those organisms to meet the different environmental needs, which will then facilitate diversification. Does that make sense? All right. So it's time for a mini lecture break. And what I'd like for you to do is take one minute, no more, no less, one minute talking with those around you, and I want you to come up with, of these two options, which provides the best explanation for the rapid appearance of an enormous amount of animal diversity, okay? One minute, starting now. All right, I want to hear some fresh voices, people that don't usually contribute to our discussions. Where's some thoughts? I can start calling people. This, this could be fun. Or we could have some people that you're like, man, I haven't said anything in a while. Let me take one for the team, so to speak. Jeremiah, what do you got for us? <laughs> okay, you like that more than like than it, than it, than that? There's a flood, the beginning of a flood. Oh, so you're talking about coupling too? Oh, I like what you're doing here. You're taking. You know what? I don't want to just use one. I want to use two. 
right? At some point, regardless of your view of origins, we need some mechanism for rapid change, right? We need some mechanism for rapid change. You're going with, let's, let's combine these two. Mm, I like it. Carlos. Open the door to get us some air and, sorry. It's just so rude. It's so rude. Sorry, Carlos. So, uh, environmental changes is more, provides more suitable places for animals to live, allowing them to spread out to many different locations. Sure. So you like this. You like this idea. Yeah, Amanda. Um, I feel like that with the flood and to look at the environmental changes, a lot of the original habitats that the animals had lived in were, were drastically changed. Mm -hmm. And so they, they, they were forced to adapt to the new environment. Yeah. Man, you guys are all combining ideas. Uh, I mean, we're, we're going to talk a lot about this when we get into mechanisms of evolutionary change. Uh, but there's, there, the, it's not an accident that the description that comes from your text starts with geographic isolation, right? Several different lagoons, and then talks about a driver to generate change, right? Different types of environments. And then finally talks about a molecular means by which those changes can happen, right? There's no accident for that because that's basically the proposal always of how do these changes happen, right? At some point, your population breaks into two that are geographically isolated. Your two populations experience different environments, and there are molecular tools that can facilitate diversification, right? So there's no doubt that, th that th there's, it's no accident that it's presented that way, and it's a very effective uh, idea. The, 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 the question isn't, can we couple this with a global flood and explain how we can get rapid diversification after a flood? Absolutely, we can do that. The question is, what provides a better explanation for a whole bunch of different forms showing up at the exact same time in the fossil record? Is it some kind of a, because this, this event here doesn't tell us anything about how you bury these animals. I don't know if you know this or not, but uh, animals decompose when they're not buried under sediment, right? And you don't fossilize something floating in a lagoon of water, okay? Something needs to be buried and buried quickly enough that you can actually shut down decomposition and give time for then the materials there, the skeleton to be mineralized slowly. It's a very slow process of actually, so I don't know if you knew this or not, but when you pull, like, say, a fossil femur from a T-Rex out, out of a dig, it is no longer bone. It's rock in the shape of a bone because it's been mineralized. Over time, every single, you know, cell in that bone and every single mineral in that bone has been replaced by the mineral in the surrounding rock. It's so cool. It's so cool, but it, it, that takes time. And if you're gonna if you're gonna have really good fossils, you've got to bury these things rapidly. And if you've got a global phenomenon of an enormous amount of animal diversity wherever you look in these Cambrian rocks, and a whole lot of it, and a whole lot of um, examples of it, there's something catastrophic happening. Right to bury that sheer variety of forms and that sheer number of forms. Autumn. Okay, so the general story with the extinction of dinosaurs is that easier? Yeah, we can't talk about that yet. So here, you can finish. You can finish. If you're going to ask me for an alternative, are, are you going to ask me for an alternative to that? Well, and how would that fossilize? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I gotcha. I gotcha. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about We're not prepared to handle that conversation yet, so sa save that one. I mean, I'm prepared to handle it, but we have to wait until we start talking about, like, really sophisticated animal bodies, okay? I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll have almost a full day where all we'll do is talk about dinosaurs. Because <laughs> who doesn't want to have a dinosaur day? Allison. All 
Yeah, so you need you need some way in which, I mean, in which those can happen, right? And so the idea, I think the idea here is that basically you've, you've got the continent covered by like what you would call an inland sea. And then as water level drops, it leaves isolated lagoons. So at one point you had a more continuous sea over the continent, water level dropped, leaving these isolated lagoons. Okay. Yeah, Aiden. How was the change after the flood? Why was that helpful for the animals other than the fact that like they just started over and didn't get the opportunity? Well, I don't think it necessarily needs to be helpful. It's just the reality of what you have, right? It's um yeah, in in many ways I think you could argue that a post-flood world is a much more difficult world to live in than a pre-flood world. And 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 I'll find I'll give you plenty of evidence, I think, to support that, that a post-flood world is a much more challenging world to live in than a pre-flood world. Yeah. But we, we have to save that. We're not ready to handle that discussion either. All right. So another thing here is like, man, environmental changes, we should see some evidence of that, right? And so we have this graph here. This comes right out of the text where it's like, hey, about 300 million years ago, there was a dramatic increase in the amount of oxygen available for living forms. And you're like, wow, it's so cool, right? You're like, more oxygen, that's wonderful. There's more material to go around for aerobic respirating organisms. But the Cambrian explosion is right here. And then, yeah, there is like an increase. There's evidence for an increase here in global oxygen. But where we really start to see something that's, that's really cool happens much later than what's happening in the Cambrian explosion, keeping in mind that we have every single animal phylum represented here in the fossil record. Every single animal phylum. And you're like, well, yeah, but we don't have humans there, which is true. And you're like, yeah, but we don't have, like, modern mammals there. Also true. But the thing about basically here all the way up until, like, here... It's all marine. It's all marine deposits. All of the sediment is demonstrating evidence of marine deposits. That, the, that, that salt water is your transport medium. It's what's carrying the animal somewhere to be buried. So we're not seeing an evidence of where the organisms lived. If it's clearly a terrestrial form buried in marine sediments, you're like, that doesn't make sense. Unless you're not seeing a record of where it lived, you're seeing a record of where it got buried, right? You're like, where does all this marine water come from to bury something quickly enough for it to be fossilized? It's a wonderful question and makes you feel a little bit like, man, I know where you could get a ton of marine water and that's, let's flood the entire earth, right? Hmm. <laughs> Mm. Anyways, we're going to have this conversation some more. Uh, but here, this, the, the, the problem also with a second idea is there's no explanation of where animals come from, right? You're like, okay, given we already have animals, let's isolate their populations. Let's provide some desire for them to change to meet environmental differences. They've got molecular tools to do that. But where do animals come in the first place? And so you'll see a description in the text of the similarity between sponges and these single-celled eukaryotes called coanoflagellates. We'll, we'll, we'll come back to this conversation. Um, and and it's, it's undeniable that there are some similarities to a cell inside of a sponge and this single-celled eukaryotic form. And so the idea there is this is where animals came from. But really, all that, all that could give you is where did maybe these cells come from? But anyways, it's a conversation we have to have later, but I just wanted to present to you that a major challenge of this view is it makes no description of where animals came from in the first place. It's like, given we have animals, this is how we could diversify them. That's a big given, right? That's like, given I have a million dollars, this is what I'll do to serve others. That's a big given, right? I don't have a million dollars. 
I know it's surprising, right? I'm sorry. I don't know. Um, ooh, this is kind of fun. So this is uh, just a different representation of the geological record than the one that we saw previously. Again, this is where we're talking right here. Cambrian explosion marks the beginning of the Cambrian period in the Paleozoic era. Okay, so right at the beginning of here, okay, which in conventional geology would be 540 to 550 million years ago, every single animal phylum shows up at the same time. No matter where globally you look in Cambrian rock. Now, you can't access Cambrian rock everywhere. The rock underneath us is very recent. California has a very recent geology, and so the rock around here is very recent. Although, do you all know Dr. Hopewell? Dr. Hopewell is in charge of online, uh, the online program here. Behind his house, they're finding whale fossils. They found a whale vertebra. They're finding what looked to be like porpoise, you know, dolphin ribs. It's so cool, but these are much, these are very, very recent, recent forms, way, way after when we would think the flood deposits have ended, because California geology is very recent, okay? But in places on Earth where you can get Cambrian rock, you find basically the same thing wherever you look, an enormous amount of animal diversity showing up at the same time in marine deposits, nonetheless. All right. Oh, boy. Gosh, we just keep going. Look at all these figures from the text. So uh, this figure uh, I put on here to remind me to tell you that there are fossils that show up before the Cambrian period. Okay? There are pre-Cambrian fossils. Okay, so here's an example of, or here are examples of a couple of different organisms, two genera, that are dated 100 million years conventionally before the Cambrian explosion. So there are fossils before Cambrian deposits, uh, but they tend to be pretty rare. Mm. And then here, here's a representation of what the Cambrian period looked like. Maybe one of one of these isolated lagoons uh, would look like. Notice it looks like a marine environment. And there's something interesting to that because all of the Cambrian period is made up of marine deposits. It's all marine deposits showing that it was salt water that provided the, uh, the, the transport medium. Whew. All right. One last slide of just figures and then we'll get to another. And I told you we'll have a longer lecture break after we finish chapter 27. So these are trilobites. And I, I told you basically all animal phyla show up during the Cambrian period, but not in equal numbers. Not in equal numbers. There are some phyla better represented than others in the fossil record. And Arthropoda, the arthropods, is one of the best represented animal phyla wherever you look in the fossil record, but especially early on. And a major... Uh, contributor to this are, are trilobites. These are these are pretty cool. Um, I don't know if you can get yourself a nice trilobite fossil on Amazon for like four dollars, and it'll, they'll mail it to you. It probably will come from China, where you've got a really big area of Cambrian rock. But it's really cool. Really cool, uh, showing basically all of your modern arthropod characteristics in an organism showing up at the very beginning. What basically is the very beginning of the fossil record. So I put this picture in there to remind you that it's not just a matter of we're representing every animal phylum in the Cambrian explosion, but the animals that are there, they are, they are very highly sophisticated forms. So we don't just need to generate all of the diversity by the beginning of the Cambrian period, but we have highly sophisticated forms that look like they lived in very similar ways to present forms. All right? Any questions about this question? All right. Here's the last question that we're going to deal with from Chapter 27. How can we explain the fossil record of animals? I'll give you a couple of different ways to explain it. First one we'll do from... Uh, methodological naturalism. 
Okay, how can we explain the fossil record of animals? First, uh, we tend to, uh, again, if you, in, if you interpret the fossil record as, as representing really long periods of time, you note several mass extinction events. Places where a significant amount of the number of species and even number of families disappear and don't continue into later rocks. And we use these mass extinctions uh, to mark the boundaries between periods. And so these are either a representation of some kind of catastrophe that is going to lead to a mass extinction event. So an example of this, Autumn, we'll talk a little bit about dinosaurs now. Okay, so dinosaurs disappear at the end of the Cretaceous, and we call that the KT boundary. I don't know if you've ever heard that before, but the KT boundary, and that's because Cretaceous in German is spelled with a K, and then the next period is the tertiary period of the Cenozoic era. Anyways, the KT boundary. Your dinosaurs, most of your dinosaur forms disappear there and do not persist after that. And so we use that to mark the boundary of, and the end of the Cretaceous. Okay, so we can interpret these as, you know, major global events that led to mass extinction events, or we can use this and say what, what, what we're actually seeing here is the the succession of different environments buried during a global flood. And remember, most of the fossil record it interpreted this way as, as the product of a massive global flood. It's not a record of where the organisms lived. Rather, it's a record of where the organisms were buried and in what order. Okay. So during each of those extinction events, we have at least some representatives of the phylum uh, will persist until later deposits. There are some phyla that disappear and, and never, uh, never appear again. So at the level of phylum, we, are we all okay with taxonomic ranks? Kingdom, phylum, class, family, wait, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species, right? These taxonomic ranks. So phylum is right underneath the level of kingdom. So you've got animal kingdom. Phylum is right underneath that. The greatest amount of diversity of animal phyla is at the beginning of the Cambrian. Because some of those phyla don't extend beyond these mass extinction events. But many of them are represented by forms that will persist into later deposits. Now... These phyla, these are real biological groupings. For example, one phylum would be arthropoda, the arthropods, which are insects and crustaceans and spiders and centipedes and millipedes and trilobites. And they all have a lot of similarities and some real biological features that unite them and separate them from other groups. And so these are real biological groupings, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it has to represent uh, an evolutionary progression. And we'll see that as we start getting into specific animal groups. And so here's the last figure that we'll demonstrate from chapter 27. And it is a representation of these mass extinction events. And uh, basically it's showing you the percentage of taxa that disappear uh, at this time. Not the percentage of phyla, but the percentage of some taxon. And I'd have to go and read and see what that is. Yeah, Carlos. Uh, so fossils, like the Bible says, like the world's been around for like thousands of sure. years. Right, so the idea is most flood models uh, would suggest that uh, the most of the geological column, which in conventional geology would represent about 500 million years, from 50 million years ago to 550 million years ago, was laid down during a global flood. So in one year. So basically one year of time is accounting for 500 million years of the geologic record. And then so before that and after that, you're still dealing with uh, what are shorter dates than what conventional geology would tell us, but not that dramatic. Trying to crash 500 um, million years into a single year, that's the most dramatic of all of it. But, uh, and we'll see, this, we'll see this time and time again, 
there's really the, the, the fossil record leaves you s- stuck without a way to really choose between those two views, whether we're representing, you know, the entire fossil record a little bit over a billion years or whether we're representing, you know, a few thousand years. You're, you're pretty much stuck. There's evidence in favor of both from the fossil record. The fossil record doesn't really provide a slam dunk for either view. Yeah, but we'll get there. All right. So here's what I want you to do in our in our more prolonged lecture break as we transition over to chapter 28. What I want you to do is go back to our tools that we had for classifying animal forms. Okay. So we talked about four um, what schemes. I think that was the, 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 the noun that I used. Four schemes that we can use to classify animals. Okay? So you can do it by symmetry. You can do it by the number of germ layers. You can do it by the presence or absence of a cavity besides the gut. And you can do it by whether they are protostome or deuterostome. All right? And what I want you to do is working as a group, I want you to come up with five five organisms. They can be five animals if you want. Um, although, yeah, actually, they have to be animals because those are schemes for classifying animals. You, you can't use others. They have to be animals. But they could be five mammals if you want, or they can be five just, you know, a nice little, that'd probably be better, a nice little representation of all animals. And I want you to classify them according to those four schemes. I told you, I believe, that this is going to be probably the greatest skill to develop from chapter 27. I think I remember telling you that. And so we're going to put it to practice. Okay, I want you to take, I don't know, you might not be able to do it in two minutes, but at two minutes I'll see what's going on. <laughs> 30 seconds. It has one in addition to the gut. Yeah, it's a true coelomate. You bet. Now the question is, is it a protostome or a deuterostome? Because remember, we talked about genetic tools separated protostomes into two groups. Ectosozoa and Lophotrochozoa. And Ectosozoa includes arthropods. All righty, so let's, let's get some animals. This is gonna be a helpful exercise. Oh, here, I need to tell you this. Okay, I need to tell you this. Uh, you probably don't need to be told this, but this is not a general zoology class, okay? Because we're gonna spend like maybe two or three weeks talking about animals, and then after it, you're gonna be like, man, it would have been nice to be able to actually talk a little bit more, because I I still don't quite understand how we do all these groupings, but this is an organismic biology class. Like, we have to talk about all living forms, right? And so we can't just spend a whole semester talking about animals, as cool as that would be. Emerson, what do you got for us? Uh, We first did the duck-billed platypus. Duck-billed platypus. Love it. So what type of symmetry? It has bilateral. Bilateral symmetry, just like us. How many germ layers? It is. Three germ layers, just like us. What about its coelom? Does it have a coelom? It does. It is a true coelomate, just like us, and a protostome or deuterostome. It's a deuterostome, just like us. Because all mammals are going to group that way. All mammals are going to group and be classified the same way we are. So if you have any animal as one of the five animals that you chose, it's going to classify just like us using those four schemes. And you're like, any mammal. I said animal, didn't I? Any mammal. It's not any animal. Any mammal will classify just like us. And you're like, wow, that's, this seems interesting. But listen, there are like 5,000, there are only 5,000 species of mammals, roughly described species of mammals. And almost a thousand of them are rodents. So it's like, it's not a huge amount of diversity. Amanda. Um, 
I I don't necessarily know about like the other like specific like categorizations, but I do know that a chambered nautilus is a protostome. Yeah, so a nautilus is a protostome. And so other than that, it will group just like we will. So a nautilus, somewhat uh, similar to a squid, somewhat, um, has bilateral symmetry. It has three germ layers. It has a true coelom, and it is above, but it is a protostome and not a deuterostome. Yeah, what's interesting to me is the fact that the chamber nautilus has like different chambers within its shell. Yeah, gas-filled chambers that help it float. All right, any insect that you chose? So remember we talked about that molecular tools have split protostomes into two groups. Ectosozoa, which according to the phylogeny we looked at, has Arthropoda and Nematoda, but I also told you tardigrades are in there, right? The moss bears, and there's also Onychophorans. We won't talk about those at all, but they're awesome. And uh, then into Lophotrochozoa, and Lophotrochozoa has mollusks, which are like snails, clams, uh, squid, octopi, all of those are in mollusks, those are lophotrochozoans, as well as uh, annelids, earthworms, leeches, right? Wonderful things that you find in there. Speaking of leeches, I have a story. So um, every summer I go and I teach at a field station in northern Michigan, and we have never ever had a leech. Where's a lake, we go in the lake every single day, and by we, I mean myself, my family, and other faculty families. Every day, we go in the lake. Never in three years did we have a leech. For the first time ever, some of our family came to visit us while we were in Michigan. First time we've had them come and visit us. My niece goes for a swim. She's in the water three minutes comes out on a swim dock, has a leech stuck right on the back of her thigh. And it's like, this is like a huge, huge leech. And this thing, usually it takes leeches a little while. I mean, they'll attach right away, but it takes them a little while to actually cut through your skin to start feeding. This thing is already feeding. She's in the water three minutes, never seen a leech in this lake. She's got a leech and this leech is feeding. And I am not kidding you. This lake, I mean, it's, it's a big lake. I mean, it's a humongous lake for California. It's a big lake for Michigan, right? A big lake for California is like a puddle that forms off the Placerita <laughs> Canyon Road during a rainstorm, right? Like, well, look at this. We could fit like five paper boats in this thing. This thing is awesome. Uh, every single house around this lake heard the squealing coming from my niece about from this leech. I mean, it was like the greatest... It was the greatest thing that I've ever experienced in my life. It was so good. All right. She, she knowingly, she came to me. She came to me, and, 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 and she couldn't even talk. But she came to me knowing I, I knew what to do. And, oh, believe me, I knew what to do. All right. What? Well, I mean, you could do that, but that takes some time. No, I, I, I just I, I stuck my fingernails right where the, the mouth part is and just pried it off like a boss. <laughs> Saved her life. Saved her life. All right, so let's do a leech. So a leech, bilaterally symmetrical, like we are bilaterally symmetrical. Three germ layers, like we have three germ layers. A true coel... Oh, oh, I was going to say they are, true they are not a true coelomate. They are a pseudo. They are a... No, that's not true. Never mind. They are true coelomates. I, yeah, I was going to say they're not pseudo. I'm just kidding. They, uh, they are true coelomates like we are true coelomates, but they are protostomes, unlike us, because we, we are deuterostomes. I remember protostome means first mouth. The first opening of the gut develops into the mouth. Deuterostomes means second mouth. Second opening that develops becomes the mouth. All right? So the first opening becomes the other end. All right? Yeah. All right. So chapter 28. Framing questions. We probably have time to deal with one of these before class ends. Uh, so how do sponge cells show division of labor? And now we can start to talk about coanocytes and coanoflagellates. Okay, so how do sponge cells show division of labor? 
So we've talked about this before. Remember, sponges do not have complex tissues. They don't have any type of symmetry. They are asymmetrical. Uh, and they don't have any germ layers. Okay, they do, though, have different cells that carry out different functions. They have different cell types that carry out different functions. And this basically is, is the definition of multicellularity. So it's different than just saying, like, sponges are not a colonial form. A colonial form is a group of the same cell type, and they may do different tasks, right? We've got um, like a biofilm that a bacteria makes, right? Remember biofilms? The, you'll have some bacteria that are functioning to attach the biofilm to the medium, although then the biofilm itself will take over, and then the biofilm will start to reproduce by sending out some bacterial individuals. But when you look in there, all of the cells are identical. Right? The, the different task is merely a feature of where they're located in that grouping. It's not an actual real division of labor like you have with truly multicellular forms. So sponges, some of the cell types they have, the first one, bless you by the way, first cell type, choanocytes, or some people say choanocytes. I don't like the way that that sounds, so I say choanocytes. Uh, these function to move water through the sponge. And so they're sometimes called collar cells. The cell basically looks like this. Here's the cell body with the nucleus. Cell body. Then we have a collar of microvilli, which are basically like little finger-like project projections, and then we have a flagellum. And so the flagellum does what flagella do, and what do flagella do? They twist, right? And as they do, they usually propel a cell through water, right? Like the flagellated spores we have in chytridio mycota. Look at that, bringing it back to fungi. You're welcome for that. But if this cell is anchored in place, the flagellum does not propel it through water. Instead, it moves the water. Okay? It doesn't move the cell, it moves the water. And what it does is it creates, as it spins, it forces water to move across this collar. And as water moves across the collar, the microvilli in this collar can trap material, and this is how the sponge feeds. Okay, so these are choanocytes. Panacocytes. Panacocytes are epithelial like cells that cover the outside of the sponge, but also line cavities. Sometimes there are cavities inside the sponge, and you're like, wait a minute. What are we talking about? These aren't like cavities, like what we deal with, with U-coelomate, pseudo-coelomate, A-coelomate, because they don't have germ layers. So we don't talk about those types of cavities. These are general cavities, just openings inside of the sponge. Okay, so panacocytes, epithelial-like cells that line the outside of the sponge, line the internal cavities. And then the last cell type that we'll talk a lot about, these are amoebocytes. And so after these choanocytes trap food, these are the feeding cells of the sponge, but every cell in the sponge needs to be fed. So you have amoebocytes that will come and will take this material and transport it around the sponge. It's like Uber Eats. Yes, like Uber Eats. That's a great analogy. Love it. But it's like Uber Eats, but then they also can take part in the sexual reproduction of, of sponges because they can carry sperm from one sponge individual to another sponge. They can differentiate into any other sponge cell type. So if a cell needs new panacocytes to line a cavity or it's gonna grow and it needs more panacocytes to line the outside of the sponge, amoebocytes develop into those sponges, or those cell types.
It needs more coanis or coanocytes for feeding. The amoebocytes can develop into those types of cells as well. All right. It is currently 1240, meaning we are out of time. Enjoy your break, and I will see you in one week. <laughs>